Hi, this is April Hewlett with the University of Idaho, and today in our Rangeland Principles course, we are going to talk about plant response to fire, and we're really going to build off a lot of the principles that we talked about in the last class when we talked about plant response to grazing. Understanding the location of the growing points or those meristematic tissues that are actively dividing on the cell is a critical characteristic when you're trying to manage any kind of plants for disturbance whether that's a grazing disturbance or whether that's fire, which we're going to talk about today. In addition to understanding the growing points, we have to understand the phenological stage of the plant community. To understand the plant response to fire, for example, it really depends when the fire occurs. Plants are much more resistant to fire if they occur, if the fire occurs when they're dormant or when there's no more active growth and the carbohydrates are in their reserve in their roots. With cheatgrass, the invasive species that's um, all throughout the West, it comes into these communities and it dries out early. And when it dries out early, it makes the community more flammable. So it can be dried out, but our active, but our native plants are still actively growing. So when a fire occurs during this situation, our native plants are much more susceptible to fire and are less likely to be able to respond positively to the disturbance that once historically probably had little impact on them. The second thing we have to think about is, is our opportunity for regrowth. Will the plant be able to produce new leaves so it can start photosynthesizing and get carbohydrates ready to reserve for the overwinter period? There are three different types of fires on rangelands typically. And whether they're positive or negative, it depends on the phenology of the plants or the timing of when the fire occurs and also about what our strategies or plans are for that area. We know that fire is a natural process on these rangelands, so there's some situations where we do want them to burn, but there's also other situations where we have really um, less resilient communities, meaning that they're not going to be able to come back after fire. And so in those situations, it'd be more of a negative response to these types of fire. So the definitions for these fires are wildfire. They're typically started by lightning or by humans, um, unintentional. Prescribed fire is intentionally ignited. And this is set under really specific conditions, meaning that we have certain temperatures, we have certain relative humidities and wind speeds that have to be met for a fire to um, occur. This, we want to have this very controlled because we don't want it to get away, obviously. And then we have wildland fire use. And this is an interesting one because it's typically an unintentional ignition, so it could be lightning or by humans, but it's not suppressed because it's in an area where there's a wildland fire plan and it meets the guidelines of that plan, so we let it burn. Plant responses to fire is going to be influenced by three different categories of characteristics. So we're going to have fire characteristics. We're going to have plant characteristics, and then we're going to have environmental characteristics. So we'll start with fire characteristics. And in fire characteristics, we have four different components. So we have fire intensity. It's going to influence how plants respond to fire. Fire intensity is the rate of heat release per linear foot. So this is typically taken on a head fire, for example, on that flame front. And we want to see how much heat is actually being released. The next one is burn severity, and this is assessment of the heat pulse towards the ground that is really affecting the herbaceous plants and the soil. So when I'm thinking about restoring an area that's been burned, for example, I often am really concerned about the burn severity because I want to know actually how much heat impacted the ground, which impacted my herbaceous plants. Fire intensity is often more associated with fire behavior, which is really critical for fire suppression. So we have like flame height, flame depth, and those kind of factors in that. The duration of the combustion is really an important characteristic. This is often related to the fuels that are on the land. So how much fuel is there, it's going to determine how much combustion and how long that combustion occurs on the land. And then we have the time of the year. So depending on our temperatures and our relative humidities, this is going to affect both our fire severity and our fire intensity. So all of this influences our plant responses overall.
So plant characteristic also determines our plant responses to fire. Plants are going to vary in how well they respond or adapt to fire based on several different characteristics. One of the characteristics that's really important is the structural and the physical characteristics of that plant. Here are two different plants. We have um, Idaho fescue on the left and then we have a blue bunch wheatgrass on the right. And just looking at those, can you see differences in the structural and physical characteristics of the plants? How do they accumulate um, standing dead or litter in those plants? Another one of the factors that we often think about in these different plants, and here's just two examples, is what's the location of that meristematic tissue? So these are both grasses, so we assume that they're really close to the soil surface which they are relatively still close to the soil surface, but actually in Idaho fescue, it's usually one to two centimeters above that soil surface versus blue bunch wheatgrass, which is more flush to the ground. So there's these different characteristics that influence our plants. So it's important to know what kind of plants we have when we have fires occur. So here are two more pictures to look at the structural and physical characteristics of plants. These are both blue bunch wheatgrass plants, and you can see that the picture's taken from the top down. They, the basal area of both of these plants is really similar, so they're good comparisons. The one on the left has been grazed recently, and the one on the right has not been grazed for about, I believe, like 15 years. So just looking at those different characteristics, which one do you think is going to be more flammable? Obviously, the one that hasn't been grazed has more dry material in it which means it has lower fuel moisture, which means it's going to ignite uh, more readily. Which one do you think is going to smolder longer or have more of an impact on those meristematic tissues, which is what's going to cause mortality in a bunch grass, for example? So obviously there's different in our management techniques, and when we think about structural and physical characteristics, we have to consider those kind of factors. So in order to understand the plant response, we have to take those physical and structural characteristics to the next step. And the next step is looking at how those two characteristics influence the temperature that the meristematic tissues experience during a fire and the duration of elevated temperature they experience. We also have to consider whether the plants are actively growing or they're dormant. If they're actively growing, they typically have higher fuel moisture content, and this makes them much more susceptible to heat, which means that we're usually seeing an increase in plant mortality, so our response would be negative to fire. A lot of my research focuses on bringing together the, the structural and physical characteristics of plants and temperature and duration and trying to determine when we actually see plant mortality. So this influences our management strategies. So if we have a fire and we have really a low severity burn where we don't have a lot of um, elevated temperatures and elevated durations, maybe we don't have to go and add seed to that fire because we didn't kill any plants. Versus if we see areas where we have really high burn severities, we're going to need to go and do some reclamation or restoration activities in these areas. So this is just uh, for one of my studies. You can see the Idaho fescue plant, and in that Idaho fescue plant, we actually have thermal couples, and thermal couples measure the temperature and the duration of elevated temperatures during a fire. So we, we uh, instrumented a bunch of bunch grasses, and then we started a bunch of fires, and we wanted to really look at plant mortality or what's going to be the response to these different fires in these controlled situations. So if you look at the graph, I'm just going to hurry and explain it. So on the y-axis, we have heat load. And heat load is looking at uh, elevated temperature and also the elevated dura duration of that temperature. So 60 degrees Celsius is when we start to see plant tissue mortality or death in our plants. So anything that's above 60 degrees C gets thrown into this category that combines these two different factors. On the x-axis, we have distance from the shrubs. So basically, when we're between 50 and 110, you can see that most of the, the shapes are gray. And gray means that the plant survived. Red means that the plants died during our fire um, trial. So if they're far from the shrub, they just have fine fuels to burn. And so they may have had some intense temperatures, but the duration was never excessive. <laughs> 
If we look at 0 to 50, this is typically, or this is grasses that are under shrubs, and they have that woody component. So during a fire, the wood actually elevates the temperature even farther than it does with um, herbaceous materials, and it increases the duration that it actually burns. So we had about 60% mortality if you're within the range of a woody fuel or a shrub. So this influences how we're going to manage the land. Here's an example of a, a fire or a plant after a fire, one day after a fire, and you can see that in this example, the temperature and the duration was not extensive enough to thoroughly kill the plant, and we still have a lot of growth on the periphery. So our plants are adapted to respond to this, but when we add that woody component, we almost always have um, higher mortality because it burns a lot hotter and longer than it does under different situations. Another characteristic could be bark on a tree. Bark thickness, bark texture, all of this influences how adaptable a plant is to fire. In addition to adaptations, we also have mechanisms of recovery. And here's an ex example of a serotonous cone, and this is in a lodgepole pine. So the fire releases the physical barriers on that cone and allows the seed to drop and to germinate and essentially reforest that area. Another mechanism for recovery could be stolons and rhizomes, or those modified stems. So stolons, which are above ground, typically are more susceptible than rhizomes, which are below the soil surface during a fire. But on the flip side, stoloniferous plants can often spread more quickly after a fire than rhizominous plants. Another mechanism could be sprouting after a fire. So this depends on the plant. Um, some plants can sprout from the base and others cannot, but this really determines a lot of times how well a plant can actually survive a fire. So sprouting can be stimulated by chemicals during a fire. It can be stimulated by opening up the canopies and allowing for more light to reach the plants. A lot of times our sprouting depends by age. Um, perhaps some of you guys have seen this after a fire in like an aspen community. These sprout, meaning that the, they come from the roots typically. One of the key factors in sprouting is to determine if you had root mortality on your plants. And this is a really good, this is a really good way to even determine plant severity. So we have kind of this table that you can look at that talks about low, moderate, and high severity fires and how it relates to sprouting. So obviously if you have a low severity fire, you don't have a lot of elevated temperatures and you don't have a lot of uh, root mortality. So you're gonna see quite a bit of sprouting when that occurs. If you have a really high severe fire or high severity fire, you have a lot of uh, your soil that was heated and you most likely had a lot of root death and mortality. So you're not gonna see sprouting on these situations. So the last factor is the environmental factor. And these are conditions before and after the fire that are really gonna affect the plant responses. So time sense fire often refers to the seed bank. So we wanna consider what seeds are going to be present and are they going to be able to reestablish following a fire? So fire is a great way to create different microsites. And microsites are just micro environments that either alter some kind of uh, environmental characteristic, perhaps it's like an indent where they can actually collect water for a little bit longer or it alters the, the temperature and so it's favorable for those seeds. And fire creates a lot of those microsites. It also exposes seeds to bare soil and that's something that a lot of them need. If you think about when you garden, typically we till up the plants, right? Because we like our seeds to have bare soil. And this is great, which, um, and fire does all of those things. Fire also can help uh, add nutrients into the soil through ash, um, and it can increase a lot of the seed production. On the flip side though, if we have repeated fires like we're seeing a lot in the West, our seed bank soon becomes depleted of our natural plants, and we're stuck with a lot of invasive species that have a lot more seeds than our native plants. Pre-fire and post-fire weather is really one of the most important factors for long-term changes in rangeland plant communities. 
When we think about pre-fire weather, we're thinking about how did the weather influence our fuels for that year? If we have a really good winter and spring, we typically have more fuels than we do if we are in droughts. Uh, Pre-fire weather could also affect those fire characteristics that we talked about at the, the beginning. Do we have high winds? Do we have low humidity? How is this going to affect our burn severity and our fire intensity? Post-fire climate is really important when we're thinking about restoration practice and we're thinking about getting our communities back to a healthy um, ecosystem that they were hopefully pre-fire. So post-fire climate is going to affect whether our plants actually survive, whether they can get their roots established before the next winter, whether they can produce seed, how they're going to photosynthesize and have carbohydrate reserves. All of that is affected by the weather. And typically in range, we the general rule is that after a fire, we can have grazing animals go back two years after the burn because we um, there's a lot of studies that show that by that time you have sufficient roots so uh, like grazing animals aren't going to pull up your plants but that all depends on on weather if you have a really good year your plants might be able to establish sooner and so you could reintroduce livestock for example earlier or if you're in a drought condition maybe your plants are not um, effectively re-establishing you have to wait a few extra years so weather is really important for management Post-fire animal use is also one of those characteristics that it, it's going to ultimately affect how your plants respond to disturbance. So we want to make sure that our plants have enough photosynthetic materials that they can survive multiple years after a disturbance. So wildlife use and livestock use is, is a critical factor that we have to consider. And here's just a quick video that explains some of that as, um, relative to wildfire. It's just two minutes, so click on the link. Fire sweeps through an area. The animals that live there must either move or be burned. Unfortunately, some of them cannot move fast enough to escape. However, a larger, longer-term question is how fire affects habitat. Few animals can survive in the immediate aftermath of a burn. Certainly there is less cover for animals to hide in and fewer homes for birds and mammals that nest in trees, shrubs, or tall grass. However, it may be a surprise that many animals are actually attracted to burned areas as soon as the plants start to recover. The grasses, flowers, and shrubs that emerge after a fire are often more succulent, tasty, and nutritious than the ones that were burned. Native Americans observed this and sometimes burned patches of prairie intentionally to attract buffalo making them easier to hunt. Deer, elk, and moose prefer the young shoots of aspen and willow that emerge after a fire. And ranchers have to be careful after burns because domestic animals may concentrate in burned areas until they overgraze range plants during a period when the plants are recovering, but still more vulnerable to damage. The ideal situation is a landscape with patches, patches of mature vegetation and lots of cover. Patches that are middle-aged, diverse, and vigorous. Patches with new growth, such as recently burned areas. Each patch has a special mix of benefits and limitations as habitat for wild or domestic animals. As with most natural phenomena, there are trade-offs with wildfire. Some animals are harmed and others benefit. Some damage is immediate. Some benefits are long-term. I'm Gene Gade of the University of Wyoming Cooperative Extension Service. Post-fire animal use is also one of those characteristics that it, it's going to ultimately affect how your plants respond to disturbance. So we want to make sure that our plants have enough photosynthetic materials that they can survive multiple years after a disturbance. So wildlife use and livestock use is, is a critical factor that we have to consider. And here's just a quick video that explains some of that as um, relative to wildfire. It's just two minutes, so click on the link. So the last environmental factor that really influences our plant responses to fire is plant competition. And this is when one plant uses the same resource as another plant, and they compete for that resource, and one is better than the other one, and so one gets reduced and one grows. So this really depends on the timing and the germination of your growth, where which one's going to be more competitive. 
So if you think about cheatgrass, you learn that it's a winter annual, so it usually germinates sooner than our native plants, and it gives it kind of a competitive edge because it can use those resources first. Um, it depends on the rate of growth. So is it going to be a slow grow, grower or is it rapid? Um, it depends on the requirement of water and nutrients by the plants. So all these things, all these factors are going to influence the plant response to fire. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's really good because it compares the differences between grazing and fire relative to plant responses. And plants are going to respond differently to these two different disturbances. For example, we'll just run through a few, but grazing, obviously, we talked about palatability and unpalatability. Well, fire doesn't care. Fire doesn't care if the plant's toxic. It doesn't care if it has thorns. It doesn't select those kind of plants. It burns everything, right? Um, we can talk about recycling nutrients. They both recycle nutrients. Fire is more inorganic forms versus grazing, which is organic and inorganic forms. One of the terms that you might not be familiar with is fire. It says it may create hydrophobic soil layers. And hydrophobic soils are basically water-fearing soils, meaning that water can't infiltrate into the soils. When a fire occurs, it creates this waxy barrier on the soils that repels water, and so water just runs off the system. Um, but on the flip side, it doesn't yield compaction, which grazing does. So just run through these, and if you have any questions, let me know. But you can, you can kind of see that they're different. We, these are both big concerns in rangeland management, but they have to be treated and managed differently. And so that's the point of this slide. Hi, this is April Hewlett with the University of Idaho, and today in our Rangeland Principles course, we are going to talk about plant response to fire, and we're really going to build off a lot of the principles that we talked about in the last class when we talked about plant response to grazing.